Eight, five, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. And welcome everyone to my presentation during which I am going to present the key results of my PhD dissertation. Before that, uh, I will do an overview of GNSS and SLR techniques. Then I will move to the theory of the precise GNSS orbit determination. And after that, I will move to the results section. I divided the results into two parts. The first concentrates on the improvement of the Galileo orbits using physical and empirical orbit models. And the second focuses on the GNSS orbit determination using solely SLR data. Eventually, I will move to the conclusions, outcomes, and perspectives. In the beginning, let's answer some fundamental questions. Why do we need to know where the navigation satellite is? Well, uh, the GNSS orbits um, are used for high, for high precision GNSS products. Starting from absolute positioning, where the absolute positions depends on the quality of the orbit throughout the determination of the global geodetic parameters and ending on sea level monitoring. Why do we want to diminish the systematic errors? Some of the GNSS based products uh, depend on the Earth satellite geometry. As a result, if we have such a systematic error, we don't want them to propagate directly into our products. How accurate the GNSS orbits have to be? Well, the current requirements of the global geodetic observing system demands the accuracy of the reference frame at a one millimeter level and its stability in time better than 0.1 millimeter per year. As a result, if the navigation, navigation system contribute to the realization of the terrestrial reference frame, it is necessary to improve all the models of the orbit determination, as well as to introduce independent techniques such as satellite laser ranging. The navigation satellites, uh, navigation systems are used for the scientific applications since 1990s. Uh, when the International Genesis Service was introduced. Henceforth, the IGS presents uh, the highly precise GPS and GLONASS data, uh, thanks to which we can determine, uh, for instance, global geodetic parameters, such as Earth rotation parameters. Since the last two decades, we are witnessing a significant growth of the number of emerging navigation systems. We have Chinese Beidou, which is being transformed from, from the regional to global system, and the first fully civilian navigation system, European Galileo. Moreover, we have two regional systems which are being developed. These are NAVIC and QZSS and they fly, fly above the area of India and Japan, supporting the global systems. Due to this uh, significant increase of the number of navigation system, the IGS established a multi-GNSS experimental pilot, pilot project to elaborate the precise orbit determination strategies for all new systems. Satellite laser ranging technique is a precise space geodetic technique that provides range measurements to the artificial satellites equipped with laser retroreflector arrays. Originally, the SLR observations are conducted to geodetic satellites. These are usually characterized with a small area to mass ratio, which makes them barely sensitive to non-gravitational forces. As a result, SLR contributes to the realization of the ITRF providing, for example, geocenter coordinates, station coordinates, and the global scale par parameter. SLR observations are conducted by station operators, and they have to choose the targets to track. Happily, the International Laser Ranging Service supports and coordinates all the station activities 
providing to them, for instance, the priority list of satellites to be tracked. As a result, as a result ILRS supports all space missions whose spacecrafts are equipped with LRAs. And so the SLR observations are not only conducted to geodetic satellites, but also to low Earth orbiters, such as GRACE, and for me, most interestingly, to navigation satellites. So we have two space techniques, which are different in terms of many aspects. First of all, the GNSS is a microwave technique, whereas the SLR uses the optical wavelengths. This implicates the differences in signal propagation of two techniques. The GNSS, as a result of this, is independent on weather conditions, whereas the SLR observations can be conducted only during cloudless conditions. GNSS is sensitive to both troposphere and ionosphere, whereas SLR is sensitive only to troposphere. The GNSS observations are governed automatically. And the SLR observations have to be conducted by the station operators. Currently, the priority list of satellites to be tracked consists of more than 50 spacecraft. And almost half of this are the GNSS satellites. Despite that, the SLR stations are capable of tracking more than 50 spacecraft simultaneously. And this is very remarkable when we look at a sparse network of the ILRS stations. Only more than 40. Especially as compared to the IGS network, which has more than 500 stations. The unperturbed orbit of the GNSS satellite can be expressed by the so-called equation of motion. This depends on the GM product A and a so and a state vector. The state vector consists of Keplerian parameters, which are expressed or referred to the particular epoch T0. The first two parameters describe size and shape of the orbit, whereas the angular par parameters describe the orientation of the satellite plane with respect to the Earth equatorial plane. All these Keplerian par parameters are estimated during the processing. However, the equation of, of motion has to be extended by a function of the perturbing forces acting on GNSS satellite. Typically, we divide these forces into gravitational and non-gravitational ones. The gravitational forces are well known and they are modeled with relatively high accuracy. However, the non-gravitational forces remain still challenging to be modeled. The highest non-gravitational force which acts on the GNSS satellite is the direct solar radiation pressure. Second highest is the albedo, which comprises the solar radiation reflected from the Earth's surface and acting, acting back then on the satellite. The third is the infrared radiation, which is caused by the accelerations um, induced by the thermal Earth, radi Earth radiation. And finally, the antenna thrust. This results from the constant radial accelerations resulting from the navigation signal which is being broadcasted by the satellite continuously. In order to determine any orbit, any GNSS orbit, at first we need to have the a priori information. Either it is a state vector or it could be a set of discrete satellite positions. We need to also supplement these with the force model, which acts on the satellite, as well as Earth rotation parameters and station coordinates for the adjustment. These two give us the set of initial orbit parameters together with partial derivatives. As for the observations, for the SLR, we can use direct range measurements, and for the GNSS, we can use either code or phase observation. This can be, for instance, the zero differences or double difference phase observations. By combining these two, we obtain a normal equation systems, which are then being adjusted using the least square methods. In the frame of this study, all the conducted calculations are done in the modified Bernice GNSS software. And this brings us to the methods of the evaluation of the orbit quality. In the beginning, we can analyze the formal errors of the orbital parameters. 
these together with other formal er errors of other estimates provides information about the solution precision or the overall accuracy, overall precision of the solution. For the one day orbital arc, we can calculate the day boundary mist closures. And these are usually calculated for the least stable part of the arc. If we have longer arcs, we can calculate, we can calculate the ob orbit overlap. And this is actually the extension of the previous method calculated for the whole day, for instance, in 15 minutes interval. These three methods give us information about the precision. If we have two orbits, which are different in, ter in terms of, for instance, different force models, we can compare position between the two consecutive orbits. Obviously, we have to have these two orbits determined in the same time window. However, this method will not indicate which of these two orbits is better. It will only prov provide the information about an impact of some effect. For the accuracy, we can use some independent to GNSS method. For instance, we can calculate satellite laser ranging residuals. The SLR residual comprises the difference between the range calculated based on the GNSS microwave orbit, the distance between the orbit and the station, and the distance between the actual range measurements, which is done by station to the satellite. Finally, we can calculate we can calculate the orbit predictions, so we can extrapolate our orbit solutions to several days, and then compare the extrapolated orbit with the consecutive calculated days. Obviously, the more stable in-time orbit, the better. So knowing the methodology of the orbit determination, as well as knowing the methods of the quality evaluation, we can move to goals of this study. And these are, at first, to improve GNSS orbit modeling by elaboration and implementation of the analytical boxing model for the Galileo satellite. Secondly, to develop the best strategy for the Galileo precise orbit determination based on empirical and analytical models. And finally, to develop a methodology of the precise GNSS orbit determination using solely SLR data to GNSS satellites. The first part of the results concentrates on the improvement of the Galileo orbits using physical and empirical models. And the results which were calculated for this part have been published in two uh, journals, in Journal of Geodesy and in GPS Solutions. The Galileo constellation is being developed since the beginning of the 21st century. After a successful in-orbit validation stage, a fully operational capability phase has begun. After a series of launches of the FOC satellites, now we have 24 operational satellites on orbit. However, it was late 2017 when it turned out, uh, when it turned better for the Galileo orbit determination. As then, ESA released the Galileo satellite metadata, which contain both optical and geometrical properties of the Galileo satellites. Typically, for the GNSS orbit determination, we use the empirical models, such as this one, the empirical code orbit model, ECOM2. The ECOM2 model decomposes the accelerations acting on the satellite into three directions, from satellite to sun, direction D, direction Y, which is parallel to the solar panel rotation axis, and direction B, which completes the right-handed orthogonal reference frame. The ECOM model considers both constant terms as well as the periodical terms, which are a function of delta U. Delta U is the argument of the latitude of the satellite with respect to the argument of latitude of the sun. The D0 oh. term absorbs direct SRP acting on the solar panels and mean SRP acting on the satellite bus. Terms Y0 and B0 are for the absorption of so-called Y and B biases. These may appear due to misalignment of solar panels. The cosine terms 
absorb variable SRP acting on the satellite bus, whereas the sign terms are for the absorption of some other ther thermal effects. The ECO model has, however, some limitation. First of all, it considers the yaw steering mode. The yaw steering uh, is an attitude when the satellite continuously points with the z-axis where the navigation antennas are mounted to the, uh, to the Earth center. And secondly, the solar panels are perpendicular to the sun. However, uh, when the sun is close to the orbital plane, that is when beta angle is close to zero, the Galileo satellites switch into a so-called modified yaw steering mode. And additionally, when the satellite is here, so where delta yaw angle is close to 180 degrees, and the satellite enters the Earth shadow, the ECOM parameters are set to zero. Moreover, higher order, order terms of the solar radiation pressures are neglected in the currently used version of the ECOM2. As a consequence, we can see uh, the systematic effect for the eclipsing period in the SLR residuals calculated to Galileo FOC satellite based on ECOM2. We can see, especially here for the orbit noon and here for the orbit midnight, significant increase of the SLR residuals. My idea to solve this limitation is to introduce the analytical boxing model for the Galileo satellite. And this is possible thanks to the metadata released by ESA. The boxwing model can simplify the satellite to the satellite bus, which is the box, and the satellite wings, which are the solar panels. I composed and implemented such a model to the Bernice GNSS software. Such boxwing model is uh, very profitable as it can describe the course of the accelerations acting on the satellite as well as present the highest magnitudes or the lowest accelerations acting on the Galileo satellites. And here, the, accelerate, the, the presented accelerations here are due to the direct solar radiation pressure acting on the Galileo FOC satellite in D and B directions. However, what we are really interested in is how the hybrid solutions based on boxwing model helps in the precise orbit determination. To do that, I extended the standard solution, which is based on the empirical model, with the analytical boxwing model. As a result, I obtained a series of hybrid strategies, all of which are based on the boxwing model and the, series and the set of the empirical parameters. In the first case, concerning, considering all the parameters of ECOM2. In second case, neglecting the periodical terms in D, and in the third case, considering only constant accelerations acting on satellite. As the efficiency, as the efficiency of the boxing model, I analyzed the empirical parameters calculated in two solutions, in standard with green and with hybrid with red. And by the analysis, especially of these parameters, which is D0, we can see that the boxing model is capable of absorbing of up to 97% of the direct SRP. We can see this because the accelerations in the hybrid solutions are by two orders of magnitude smaller than in the standard one. The accelerations calculated in Y0 and B0 terms are the same in two solutions. As a result, the boxing model did not absorb them. So the two, uh, the two accelerations uh, estimated in the frame of these parameters are not do, or do not have the solar radiation pressure interpretation. These may result either from solar panel rotation lag or they could be uh, resulting from the thermal re-radiation of the asymmetrically radiators which are placed on each Y panel of the Galileo FOC satellites. Same terms uh, also assume the same values in both hybrid and standard solutions and they are shifted uh, with respect to the cosine terms, which may indicate the re-radiation effect. As for the quality indicator, I calculated SLR residuals to all the solutions. As you can see, this, 
the systematic effect, which was visible for standard solutions in the eclipsing period, is now gone for the hybrid solution, which considers the box wing model and a second set of the empirical parameters, which are consistent with classical ECO-1 model. And this is the confirmation uh, in the statistics, because the standard deviation of SLR residuals for the eclipsing period, for which the beta angles are lower than 12 degrees, we can see the improvement at the level of 15 millimeters. The overall accuracy or the overall standard deviation of SLR residuals is diminished as well from 30 to 25 millimeters. The hybrid solution, however, is not without the drawbacks because with the application of the box ring model, I also applied a offset at the level of six millimeters, which is still under the investigation. The second part of the result concentrates on the Galileo uh, GNSS orbit determination using solely SLR data. And the results from this part were also published in, the, in, in two journals, in Journal of Geodesy and in IEEE Transactions on Geoscience and Remote Sensing. Let's begin this part with a state of liter literature concerning GNSS orbit determination using solely SLR data. The first attempt was conducted by Pavlis in 1995 when he tried to determine GPS orbits using only SLR data. However, he obtained a one meter level accuracy. Urush et al. in 2007 and 2008 determined orbits of the very first Galileo satellites, but due to the limited information about the Galileo satellites, as well as due to poor number of SLR observations, she also obtained a meter accuracy. Montenbruck et al. in 2015 determined orbits of NAVIC satellites. However, due to a low number of SLR observations, as well as due to poor geometry of SLR stations, the 3D accuracy of the determined orbits was at a level of 18 meters. What is missing in all these three studies? Well, the, all these studies lack of the recommendation for the boundary conditions, which concerns the number of, of SLR observations and the number of SLR stations, which are needed for the precise GNSS orbit determination. So in the frame of the study, I calculated the SLR-derived orbits of GNSS satellites and compare them with code MJEX microwave orbits. Here in this figure, you can see the differences between SLR and microwave orbits calculated for a middle day of the three days, of the three day solutions. And the differences in radial along track cross track, which are calculated based, uh, based for these solutions, are quite, quite high, as you can see in scale at the level of six meters. This is due to the fact that this solution was calculated using only 25 observations. And as it turns out, this number is insufficient. Because when we double increase the number of observation to more than 50, the radial and along track component become consistent with the microwave orbit. However, we can still see some a once per revolution systematic effect for the cross track direction. With another double increase of the SLR observations to more than 100, we obtain the cross-track component also consistent at a level of centimeters. So you can see that the quality of the SLR-derived orbits strictly depends on the number of SLR observations which are mm, employed to the determine of determination of the orbit. As a result, I present here the RMS of differences between microwave and SLR orbits as a function of the number of observations. The faint dots here uh, represent the, all the solutions, whereas the bigger dots denote the median values of the RMS calculated in bins of five observations. Uh, in order to determine the GNSS orbit, we need to have at least 13 SLR observations. That's because we have to address six Keplerian and seven empirical parameters in this case. But if we have less than 60 SLR observations, we can see that the quality of the SLR-derived orbits is very poor. Only when we increase the number of SLR observations to more than 100, 
brings us, brings us the quality of the orbit at a centimeter level. Not only the number of observations is important, but also the number of SLR stations. Because if we have only SLR observations provided by five stations, we can see that we cannot reach a centimeter level quality. With the increase of the number of SLR stations to 10 and more, brings us to a better quality orbit. This is why when we have 10 or more stations, there is a huge chance that we have observations provided not only from the European stations, but also from Australia and North America. And this gives us much better observation geometry. Finally, I investigated the impact of the arc length on the SLR-based orbit solutions. And as a standard, I calculated the three-day arc. And then I checked five, seven, and nine-day nine nine arcs. You can see that if we have an increase of the orbital arc, the RMS decreases. However, for the nine-day solution, we can see the degradation of the free deposition with respect to five and seven days. That's because we always estimate to the beginning of the arc set of Keplerian and empirical parameters. And these parameters, after nine days, become obsolete. In the case of five and seven days, we, can, we obtain similar quality of the solutions. As a result, it is better to have a five-day solutions having more updated parameters. I also compared the results from the five-day SLR-only solution uh, with the mm, microwave multi-GNSS uh, orbit consistency. And as you can see, in the case of radial and the long-track component, we fit within the range of the quality of the microwave orbit. The only outlier is a cross-track, which sadly spoils a little bit the 3D accuracy as compared to the microwave orbits. In the case of the consistency between SLR and GNSS solutions, Sośnica and Otsubo determined the blue sky effect values based on the SLR observations to Lagos satellites. However, some of the SLR stations track mainly GNSS satellites. As a result, the blue sky effect is not evaluated for such stations. So what is this blue sky effect? As you may remember from the beginning, we have two different space geodetic techniques. We have GNSS and SLR. And GNSS can be conducted regardless of the weather condition, whereas the SLR, where SLR cannot be conducted during the cloud, cloudy condition because laser cannot penetrate through clouds. During such a conditions, the Earth crust is either neutral or slightly uplifted. In contrary to, to previous conditions, during the good conditions and sunny weather, uh, there is a high atmospheric pressure which deforms the Earth crust downwards. So this fluctuation of APL are characterized with an annual signal. And if we have continuous GNSS observations, the mean impact of this effect is close to zero. So if we have SLR observations, which are only or mostly conducted during such a deformation, we may introduce the systematic effect, which is called the blue sky. Here is the confirmation of blue sky, because we've read we have the continuous APL signal, and with blue, we can see the signal which is calculated for the corrections which are applied only uh, when the SLR observations are conducted. And immediately you can see here and there and some more gaps. And the difference between these two signals can be referred to the blue sky effect. In the frame of this study, I calculated the blue sky effect values for all the stations which provide SLR observations to GNSS satellites. The highest um, values of the blue sky effect um, occur for inland stations such as, he, such as here, Svetloje, 2.3 millimeters, Baikonur, 2.2 millimeters, and Altai, 2 millimeters. This seem to not be maybe too much, but when you remember the requirement of GIGOS of a one millimeter reference frame, 
all the systematic errors, even at a millimeter level, should be taken into consideration. I would like to end the results sections, section with outcomes and perspective. In the frame of the study, I implemented the boxing model, which is very help helpful for the um, or Galileo orbit determination, especially in the, during the eclipsing period. So if we have a good boxing model and we have elaborated the strategy for the GNSS observations using only SLR data, why not conduct the combined GNSS and SLR solutions? So I did that experiment, and as a result, we can see that the SLR observations are additionally contributing to the stabilization of the, of the Galileo, in this case, IOV satellites, during high beta angles, which are here for the betas more than 60 degrees. Here is the confirmation in statistics. Uh, so we have slightly uh, higher improvement for the combined solutions as compared even to the hybrid one, and additional effect at a level of six millimeters for these high beta angles. Nevertheless, the overall standard deviation of SLR residuals is at a level of 26 millimeters, which means there is still plenty to be done for the improvement of the Galileo and other system orbits. So now let's move to the two main conclusions. Uh, in the frame of this study, I composed and implemented to the Bernice Genesis software the analytical boxing model for the Galileo satellite. And this model is capable of absorbing of up to 97% of direct SRP, whereas the remaining accelerations can be absorbed by additionally estimated empirical parameters. And the best strategy for the Galileo precise orbit determination comprises the aforementioned boxing model with a set of empirical parameters which are consistent with ECOM-1 model. Secondly, I define the boundary conditions for the GNSS precise orbit determination using only SLR observations. And to do that, we need to have at least 100 SLR observations collected by at least 10 evenly distributed SLR stations within a period of five days. Additionally, I investigated the inconsistency which results from the blue sky effect and this reaches the level of almost three millimeters for the inland SLR stations. And this brings me to the end of my speech. Thank you very much for your attention.